These dark corridors are not your true home. There is a world above. There's a world above. I'll find a few alive. Get the claws off him, you boys. One scum. This time, you've lost the good. <laughs> Don't leave me on. I'll die without you. He who possesses this sword possesses the power of truth. Every day I wake up, it's still the present. The same grimy, boring present. I don't think this future thing exists. They're gonna use you to figure out where the Titan is. So what did the human race ever do to the Dredge? It's not what we did. Hmm. They're afraid of what we might become. Welcome to Journey Through Sci-Fi. With me, James. And me, Matt. Every series on this podcast, we explore the world of science fiction cinema by taking a trip through a different subgenre of sci-fi. This series, our journey is through the fantastical world of space opera. Welcome back, listeners, to our journey through space opera. This time on the show, we're sticking with the animation theme following our uh, return to Japanese space opera anime movies last time. Uh, And this time we're looking at how Hollywood treats space opera in its animation and how American animated movies deal with the fantastical nature of space opera themes and visuals. Uh, James, what movies have we got lined up to talk about this? Well, we have two very interesting movies to cover and like you said at the start we are heading to hollywood we're getting all glitzy and star studded to look at these two films today so we are covering star chaser the legend of orin from 1985 and we're pairing that with a nice side of titan ae from the year 2000 i hadn't seen either of these films before i hadn't even heard of uh, star chaser the legend of orin so it was interesting to pick these up um, but immediately kind of captured by the the, the very familiar space opera tropes in both of them and how they they fit into this genre uh, so well and such good examples of it. And also really interesting to see the, just the way animation is used in these films to present space opera. Because it, it was a whole different... It's a, it's a whole different ball game in anime, isn't it? It's, um, it's got its own cinematic language uh, in, in Japanese anime. This is very much the American Hollywood model of filmmaking, but within animation, it was all, it's all very interesting from that perspective for me. Yeah, it's been good to look at this off the back of our anime episode because seeing the the differences in american animation and what they're going for in hollywood with these blockbuster well apparent blockbuster animated versions of of space opera they're leaning a lot more on the star wars influence as we will get into as we get into in almost every episode of our space opera series at the moment everything post 77 (laughs) everything post 77 and all of these these things are just culminating in these really interesting animated space operas, these space adventures. I think they both offer something a little bit different from what you would get in a standard live action sci-fi. So I'm looking forward to diving into these two today. Shall we make a start with Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin from 1985 then? Yeah, get your laser sword, your, your sword hilt at the ready, Matt, because we're going to go on a space adventure. Get my sword hilt at the ready. (laughs) All right, let's go. (laughs) It all makes sense at some point. In a distant galaxy, the darkened caverns of a cruel world hold the secret to a fantastic adventure. A quest to free a world from slavery and the universe from tyranny. A quest for truth, dignity, and freedom. There is a world above. A magnificent universe you can return if you have the courage. A quest for Star Chaser, the legend of Arlen. So now that you're fully prepared with your sword hilt, Matt, are you ready to talk about Star Chaser, the legend of Orin and the madness that this film is? This is a this is a strange movie, isn't it? Because, um, I, I mean, I'll just come out of the gate that like when you start watching this film, it just looks like uh well it looks a bit like what i've seen of he-man 1980 saturday morning cartoons it looks cheap right it looks like a tv show 
but then it kind of takes you by surprise uh, as it as it ramps up and it carries on just in terms of the production value and starting to look like a movie basically but I, I have to admit when I first put this on I was a bit like oh this is just like what is this compilation of tv shows like last time yeah it's interesting that kind of viewpoint that we look at it from now because at the time this film was quite revolutionary in its animation style apparently so it's it mixed traditional animation methods and rotoscoping uh, which you talked about rotoscoping before so with this particular kind of animation they were doing they'd have actors act out the scenes and then they would draw over them to try and create more realistic animation. But they were also using 3D technology in there as well to try and create these, these animated films. So in Star Chaser, you've got a combination of 2D animation and 3D techniques as well. And to top it all off, they put it out in 3D. And it was one of the first animated films you could see in 3D and you could actually watch the, the 3D version on YouTube with the, the green and reds, like you need those cardboard glasses to watch it, to see it all pop out at the screen at you. Yeah, and this is a contemporaneous, roughly, uh, give or take a few years, with uh, uh, Macross, Do You Remember Love, that we looked at last week, which had really, you know, mind-blowing animation. It was a fantastic-looking movie. Um, and it's interesting because... There's something, I don't know, there's something quite wasteful about all that rotoscoping and stuff. It's it's it, just an incredibly expensive process, it sounds like, to film live actors and then draw over them and do animation as well. So you're basically doing most of the process of a live action film, or some of the process anyway, plus all of the process of an animated movie. It seems wasteful, especially because I think that that, process makes it look a little bit lifeless certainly like for the characters for the characters facial expressions i think you really lose something there trying to trace over a, a live actor you, you lose the best of both having a live actor and having animation um whereas if you had just animated something from scratch you would have all of that kind of the heart of the 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 drawing and the animation put into it and have a lot more character to it so it's a weirdly wasteful process it seems to me it was used a lot by disney as well was back it? in the day yeah because there are certain because there's always if you look at stuff like the robin hood disney film and then you look at the jungle book blue is the same bear moving and the same sort of character drawn in it? both of those yeah in both of those films so they were kind of utilizing it again and again but initially just to get that movement they'd oh, that, i think again it's the time consuming element of it and like you say the kind of it wasn't so much wasteful for disney i guess because sure they were just reusing it again and again like certain scenes if you look up disney comparison scenes it's exactly the same movement the same animation they've just changed the clothing and the setting so it's quite it's quite interesting that animation usage maybe i'm misjudging it then maybe um what i was seeing in the characters faces is, is just um poor animation uh, <laughs> and because to be fair there's you know some of the fighting is pretty good in this film and it has quite dramatically animated movements in the you know the the hand-to-hand -hand combat and the sword fights and stuff like that looks pretty cool later on in the film so maybe that's where we're using that technique um and i'm sort of mischaracterizing the bits that i don't like but it is very much an 80s animation and all the techniques are very much of the era aren't they it is also one of these films that came out in the wake of star wars which was largely considered to be a ripoff so it was produced by young sung productions who also made the star wars animated series droids they were so bold with their tagline so this came out a few years after return of the jedi and the tagline for it was the search for the force is over the adventure is about to begin so uh, i think that's a pretty bold statement the force uh, is over. it's really interesting that isn't it because it doesn't um it doesn't apply to the film does it like you, you, if you're going to do a line like that you want it to be almost a a, a, a double meaning don't you you want it to have a legitimate sort of description of the film but also make a jab at star wars but there's no there's no force that the search is over for in this film it's literally just a, a star wars reference isn't it yeah and you would have thought that 
the Star Wars lawyers would have got involved over something like that because, as we know, they were going after any property which was seen to be ripping off Star Wars and going in on them. I don't know whether it was like the connections with the production company and the animated series of droids or if because it was an animated film they felt it was more removed from Star Wars. Possibly it is just because there is no The Force. I don't even know if you can trademark the words The Force and then even if you can, they're not used in the film uh, and it's not in a similar way. Uh, And they're quite careful with, I mean, the sword is... that Basically everything about this film like borrows heavily from Star Wars and is heavily influenced by Star Wars, but never never too direct in fact we've seen worse we've seen films this series that that lean more heavily on star wars stuff star crash had that laser sword as well as as well as psychic powers you know it felt like a much more direct ripoff whereas this one has a magical sword that's lost its blade which kind of projects a blade through magic you know it's it's very much not a lightsaber but if you just come away from uh the decade of star wars you're you're good, you're primed to enjoy a little bit of uh, space fantasy with with magic swords in what was the term you used sword and uh, um, no science S- and sorcery or sorcery and sword and planet like uh sword, sword and planet uh, sort of a take on sword and sandal but i think it's sword and planet yeah and of course the before mentioned famous hilt from this which becomes yeah. this this strange sword which i was alluding to at the start uh, of today's episode so it's got all of these similarities to star wars but because it's animated it feels like it can get away with some of those a bit more but we talked about the sword what what the hell does the sword have to do with the film what is the plot of star chaser the legend of orin then it's about Orin, uh, who is a slave on what he believes to be a planet called Mine World, but it's in fact, they he's kept underground with all of his friends and family and people of his species uh, on this planet, subjugated by a god called Zygon. Um, he finds the sword. The sword also has like a secret message, sort of psychic message in, telling them that there's a world above leading him out to a, a great adventure across the galaxy to find out the truth of this sword's message um, and eventually coming back to overthrow Zygon and stop his evil plot to enslave Orin's planet and many other planets and take over the whole galaxy. So you've got all of the components of a, of a good space opera there. You've got an evil empire that you've got to overthrow. You've got a courageous hero. You've got a quest. These are all sort of by the numbers space opera yeah. components right many exotic locations for the characters to visit and get into scrapes and uh, exotic villains and, and creatures and mandroids in this film as well uh yeah lots of exotic stuff happening and and whizzing through the various episodic scenes where those where those events happen ultimately getting orin into the big battle at the end but but more about just looking a bit fantastical and fun on the way and i was quite struck by how as old it felt compared to what i would have expected from this kind of animated film at the time because it's a space opera you've got like the star wars market just there but this feels a lot darker than your average kind of space opera it's very adult in some of its themes yeah people die quite violently and get limbs chopped off it tends to be uh, robot characters that get chopped up the most uh, visibly which is a classic film and animation trick isn't it to to really ramp up the violence is is to have it done to android and robot characters um but it's pretty it is pretty dark and violent not quite sweary but the characters talk in quite a mature way because it does look like a kids film doesn't it it looks like a, an animation film this is this is not just for kids as as friend of the show russ would would put it like this is this is like trying to straddle both things but the extent to which it achieves that i think is i'm not 100 percent sure about to be honest because i think it's marketed towards kids but produced with it with a more adult audience in mind yeah because there were a few things which really grabbed me like i like you're right and most of the violence is kept to strange aliens that they're slicing up or or robots but at the same time you see Orin's grandfather 
get a laser whip round the heads, blinding him and killing him off within the first 10 minutes or whatever it is of the film. His girlfriend gets her neck snapped by Zygon. There's all of these quite horrendous deaths, but then you throw in this weird sexual stuff as well that's going on. So you've got this oh, yeah. smuggler guy, Dag, who is reprogramming this robot Silica, but he's basically fiddling, fiddling around with her bum. Mm. And it's all very sexualized. And then she's very into him afterwards, after they've had that moment. And her personality is in her ass. <laughs> yeah. And there's something very dodgy about that as well. It seems like all of that stuff is in there for an adult audience. But even so, I'm just a bit like, it It just seems a bit misplaced almost. Yeah, definitely. Definitely as well. And in 1985 as well, just if you think about who who is going to see this, who is going to see the poster for this or see the front cover of it in, in a blockbuster, it's it's kids. Kids are going to be interested. But I, I, I don't know if like, if that stuff just goes over kids heads and that the, you know and that's always been relied on because i'd also say like there's a lot of like sort of sexual innuendo and stuff like that in more live action movies that are more family oriented i think what makes it a little bit weird in star chaser is that it's i don't know it's a bit creepy and sleazy isn't it the, yeah. the scene that you're talking about there in particular reprogramming the fembot through her ass and then and then she's very f- fond of him in a sort of slightly unpleasant way afterwards. It's not very, like, wholesome, is it? It's the fact that he's basically reprogramming her personality yeah. to like him, which seems really weird as well. And also so that he can then sell her into slavery. That's the, yeah. the point of doing that, is to make her more compliant so that he can offload her to a slaver so yeah so you've got weird elements like that just getting chucked in which kind of make it seem more like an adult film and even the animation i was reminded of heavy metal and we covered heavy metal over on patreon it's a film it's an anthology film animated and it's got more of a teen adult audience slant to it that's what that's who it's designed for all of the stories are quite adult in nature and fantastical they've got space opera elements to them and i kept thinking about that and also kept thinking about sort of the music in this as well because it's quite got a because heavy metal they've used like heavy metal songs in there as well haven't they they've used a bit more rock music and this felt like it could almost have a bit more of that but it was very much like your traditional star wars score underlying these things which kind of made it rooted more in your animated kids film rather than your sort of teen audience which could potentially be interested in this film yeah i i agree it put me in mind of heavy metal uh the the animation style in particular and the sort of depiction of women or or i guess silica in in particular because she's really the only woman that gets much screen time i guess there's the kind of princess leia character as well but i i I don't know i i it it missed the mark for me. I was quite fond of heavy metal because heavy metal is so unashamedly what it is, which is very teenage. Whereas, like I was saying, this kind of straddles the age groups a little bit. So all of that sexualization around silica, I actually found quite awkward and and misplaced in this film. Whereas in heavy metal, that it's it's all just very upfront with that from the get go. And I think you, I think you kind of know what you're getting into a little bit more with heavy metal. Um, whereas stuff that straddles levels of appropriateness feels a bit more uncomfortable for me in star chaser yeah i'd agree with that because they do just they do put you a bit on edge when you're looking at looking at this film now from a modern lens but also the space fantasy angle is something i wanted to talk about as well because it's it's very fantastical in nature we talked about the sword hill and the the magical nature of that but it felt like i was watching a fantasy film at the beginning because you've got this this race of people who are enslaved underground and then he finds himself in a swamp and there's alien creatures and even just the swamp setting reminded me of stuff like crawl which felt more like a like a space fantasy so what did you think about those kind of fantasy elements? Was there anything else that you saw in the film that really reminded you of a fantasy film? Yeah, Kroll was like the, the 
a big reference in my mind. It felt like Krull, but but animated like heavy metal in the beginning. Um, but then all of that kind of shifts away and is is taken over by a more Star Wars influenced uh, set of tropes. After that, we have we have a Han Solo character basically show up once we get to those swamps. We're introduced to Han Solo's spaceship, and then that's the vehicle by which we travel through the rest of the locations in the film. So it's it started in that kind of like space fantasy sword and planet thing, and then it it picks up a much more Star Wars frame of reference and goes with that. And also we've got like it's eventually revealed that the bad guys, the evil empire that we're fighting against, are all robots. An interesting addition to a space opera film because I don't think we've seen much of that before, um, and it makes it feel much more science fictiony uh, to have uh, sort of a villainous race of robots to go up against. And even having the villains being the robots, it still went back into a fantasy mode though as well because it's it's a legend around this yeah yeah this evil empire this Zygon turns out to be the Nexus or something, I think they call him, that has been around and has been fighting rebels off in the past. And it turns out that he's actually a robot. And that's sort of the big reveal, isn't it? Pretty great bad guy, right? I really liked Zygon. Yeah, because he just kept... The layers kept coming back off of him, didn't they? Because at first he he's a bit of a almost like an Indiana Jones kind of scene, like Temple of Doom when he's yes, there with his mask yeah. pretending to be a god. And then you find out he's just a man. And then you think he's just a man, but no, he's actually a robot. And he's actually not just any robot. He is the robot which has been building up these plans for millions of years and enslaved your race and been pulling the strings all along. So it just goes, he, he ups the ante the more you find out about him. But he's a very dramatic robot in the vein of other space opera villains like like emperor ming uh he's yeah he's, he's very over the top he's got some great dialogue like where he's talking about chess computers on earth checkmating humans for the first time and i'm picking up the legacy of that you know he's he's, he's very theatrical and uh a lot of fun and he's get he's, there's moments where like bits of his face get torn off and you see the in a mechanism inside his skull working while he's talking he's a really great villain quite scary uh and very dramatic i absolutely loved him i thought he was probably the best part of the film yeah he was really good there's lots of other there's this kind of ensemble cast again you've already mentioned dag we've got orin who's basically a luke skywalker we've got aliana who is like your princess leia yeah but she's not very autonomous is she you just see her in a few scenes she's bidding against orin for silica in one scene and then she pops back in later on and it's very much like what's happening here the thing that i did like is that her companion is a robot that is riding a horse at one point and i've never seen a robot ride a horse (laughs) in a sci-fi film so i quite enjoyed that okay nice yeah yeah good point (laughs) <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't picked up on it but yeah you're right and then on top of that we've also got we've got uh so we talked about silica silica kind of becomes a bit of a r2d2 by default she obviously she talks in english but because she's paired up with arthur the the ship's intelligence and arthur is very much c3po isn't he a sort of mm. effete worrisome uh ai voice that's it's like the reverse, isn't trouble. it? Because Silica's looks like more like C3PO yeah. Yeah. and Arthur looks more like R2D2 potentially just because he's not got a face. Yet his personality is definitely C3PO, isn't it? Yeah. I think criticism of this film being a, a rip off of Star Wars is valid. However, like what's ripped off is the character design c- completely. Like all of the characters, a- apart from Zygon, who has a little bit of Darth Vader in him but but really he feels like a much more original character and concept to me and I think that's why I think he's the best thing about the film but but apart from him all the other characters are just using templates from Star Wars to to fill out the cast that being said I don't think it's much of a rip off of Star Wars it's a space opera movie that uses those character templates so it feels like a rip off and you've got the magic sword thing but I think it, you know, it it does other stuff. It goes off in other directions. I think it's a slight disservice to the movie to just write it off as, uh, you know, a very basic Star Wars ripoff. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's so interesting that every space opera now becomes a Star Wars ripoff. 
Whereas other genres of film, you don't really get that as much, do you? It's not like every every Western film is like one particular film and that's the only model that we're ever going to base it on. It feels like space opera in particular just has that kind of... It's it's hard to get around that just because of how popular Star Wars was. But I can't think of an example in a different genre which is like that in a way. I think that space opera can kind of take over a film more than other other subgenres do the kind of tropes of space opera even like going back to was it brian aldis who wrote that list of uh, mm. uh, like a checklist and like you couldn't really say that many other subgenres of sci-fi have a checklist of how the plot should be structured can you like time travel ai you know these are these are just concepts that allow writers to do, do anything really just uh, just explore any kind of topic they want to talk about but using a a, a narrative device or a, or a, a you know a concept to trigger events basically so characters can travel through time in my in my movie what does that mean for these characters that i've thought up and and how they interact with each other and then you explore that for 90 minutes whereas to have a subgenre that can be boiled down to a checklist does actually limit your scope of plot and then within that to have one of the you know the most culturally important movies ever made comes out within that framework so it's hard to break away from that and even if you do break away from that there will be similarities that people can point to and say well this is just a rip off of star wars right yeah it's that thing about sci-fi that the majority of sci-fi films are considered sci-fi because of certain tropes and things that they're using in the film whereas this is a more like you say a set of plot points and narrative devices that make your film a space opera and that can be thrown in with tropes and settings and things like that but it's more than that in space opera it is your plot structure exactly yeah so then you know it opens up to comparisons to each other basically but like i was saying i think it's a disservice to this film you know to, to just write it off i quite liked it I'm surprised by that because the way you were talking about it, you started off by saying the animation wasn't very good. And then... But then the animation completely turns around, doesn't it? Once we once we meet Dag and we get on Dag's ship and then we're having space fights and going to different locations and stuff like that, I found that the animation completely turned around and there was an opportunity for stuff to like start looking really cool. Uh, the fight scenes are really fun. I, th- I think it's quite well animated. It, it reminded me... I know we've just come off the back of it, so it's like maybe an obvious comparison to make. And I've just been talking about Macross. But it reminded me of Mobile Suit Gundam in the sense that uh, it felt like it, the animation was as good as it could have been. I would like for the animation to be better in this film. I would like for this to be 90s or noughties, 10s, whatever animation. But it it feels like they are working really hard and, and making it look really cool. And there are some good scenes. There's a... Uh, chase through some canyons i thought that looked amazing towards the end and yeah the 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 fight scenes at the end were yeah they all look great yeah it's got some really good set pieces in it and i really liked all the world building and stuff and you talking about the way it looks in terms of the animation i don't know if you heard about this but apparently in 2012 rylian or rillian pictures acquired the rights to develop this as a live action film I don't think, well, it never came to pass, but do you think that would work or would it just become too much like a like a sort of Star Wars crawl kind of rip-off in that case if it was made live action? Maybe, maybe, because the comparisons are valid to Star Wars. And if you start getting into making it live action, then those comparisons become even more obvious. Uh, and, and sort of separating it away into animation gives it a little bit of leeway to say, like, well, we are doing our own thing here stylistically. Yes, things borrow from Star Wars, but we're doing an animated version of it, basically. So it kind of has that going for it. And I think if you then do go into live action, you you really do get... You'll get bogged down in, in Star Wars, really. I can't see it not looking like Star Wars. You'd have to completely flip it on its head stylistically and make it look totally different. But yeah, it it would be hard. Yeah, it would be a tricky one to do. But I do also think that Star Wars or some of the creators of Star Wars have watched this film because there's one scene which really reminded me of something. Can you guess which one it is? Go on. It's the death of Zygon. 
So when I was watching Zygon get killed, it just looks exactly like how Darth Maul dies in episode one. He gets split in oh, half okay. by the sword. He does, And yeah. then he tumbles down this big canyon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. So I wonder if that was like a later inspiration. And then I was looking up afterwards because I was like, I can't be the only person who's thought of this. All of us have seen Star Wars now. Come on, someone else has said it. So yeah, there was that. And then someone else online made the comparison of... I don't know if you've seen Solo, but nah. in Solo... Yeah, I didn't think you would have seen Solo. <laughs> uh, so in Solo, there's a character called L337, who is basically a custom droid who is who belongs to Lando. And she's kind of got a bit more of a silica kind of trait to her. Like okay. their relationship is a bit more along those lines is what the what the person who was making this comparison alluded to, which was quite quite an interesting one. I don't know if that... I think that might have been a little bit of a reach. But then also there's been stuff like in... Apparently in Escape, uh, Escape from LA, there's a character played by Bruce Campbell who is basically trying to make mandroids <laughs> so someone was like oh it's the same idea but then i don't i, I don't mm -hmm. know you can you can say that everything is like everything else in sci-fi yeah. in some some extent and there's always going to be tenuous links just based on how vast it is mm. but i found it interesting that people are trying to make these links between this and other films yeah has it become a bit of a cult classic then i think it's more of a hidden gem Okay. than a cult classic i think there there are there are people which are big fans of it but i think it is so under the radar for a lot of people if you weren't around in that era or you didn't just come across it on vhs at the right time in your childhood it would have just eluded you yeah i can see this sticking in your head though if you have seen it for a long time <laughs> and like also when they're when they're not like super famous this is the sort of film that sticks in your head and then you just like forget what it is but it's part of your memory part of your subconscious kind of thing do you know what i mean and then one yeah. day you'll like catch a clip of it on youtube and be like oh my god oh my god and it all comes flooding back i think it'd be one of those films for some people i absolutely love those ones though where you're just racking your mind racking your brain to try and think of what what that was from but then since the invention of the internet and google you can put the worst sentences together to try and figure out what these films were i've done that many a time on random films i saw back on back in the day on tv just trying to track these down trying to track down those clips but yeah it does have that feeling of nostalgia to it doesn't it yeah yeah definitely it's very nostalgic yeah i thought it was good i thought it was a good film i enjoyed the animation overall i think it it kind of like it drops the ball in 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 many ways like like you said that the, there are reasons why it it could be considered a hidden gem but calling it a cult classic is too far and it's never going to be a cult classic because it it just kind of like fumbles the ball it's not dreadful enough to be sort of camp and and remembered in that way and but it's not like this overlooked brilliant thing you know that, that people absolutely love and cherish uh, there's there's lots of things like a, a big one for me was there's like no resolution at the end with who the kind of like spirits were that were like floating around the whole film and helping out Orin and then they they let him become one of them but I, I was just like but who, who are these guys the the whole legend you know the, the the legend of it which is the title of the movie mm. was unclear that this prophecy thing that Zygon was worried about from 1200 years ago didn't didn't get much of a sense of that no it was kind of alluded to that they were the people which were battling Zygon in the past and they all had this special power or whatever it was Sure. But again, it's very thin on the ground. They're, yeah. they're space flies for the majority of it, just buzzing around like little different colored fairies almost. And then they turn out to be these old men who are ghosts of the past. Yeah, basically, that's that's all we get. The fantastical side of it. And so many times in space opera films, there's there's loose bits of plot which don't fully get fleshed out because of the nature of these films. Well, no, I mean, like, I think what we're more used to is like that concepts don't get explained with any science and that's fine. But I do sort of expect concepts that are integral to the plot to be explained with plot, basically, I think is what <laughs> I'm saying. Like, who were these people in the past, you know? What was the nature of their battling with uh, Zygon, all of that stuff? Oh, you know, 
but you know, all, it, you, it all you need to know, Matt, is that Oren is a very special little boy who's got magical powers, <laughs> and he's got a special laser sword that comes out of his hilt. And it turns out the power was within him all the time. Yes, it's a great. Uh, you had the power all along at the end. Didn't yeah, it? and he's able to. Of course, he has to be able to cure his blind brother at the end of it oh yeah because he (laughs) couldn't he couldn't possibly just have a blind brother could he no he has to he has to fix him in some way yeah yeah just to just to give it that extra over the top hollywood ending that really was uh (laughs) but terrible little addition at the end (laughs) but what an adventure it was finding out all about orin and the star chaser and and man droids and whatnot and all of that crazy stuff but shall we talk about our next film on the agenda then matt yes titan ae hi listeners if you're enjoying the show and want to support what we do you can sign up to our patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash journey through sci-fi And if you subscribe at the warp speed level, you'll get access to our regular bonus episodes, as well as the whole back catalogue. We've got a host of mini-series, like deep dives into the Terminator and Planet of the Apes franchises, as well as the Bad Movie Bunker, and reviews of the latest sci-fi films. Plus, you'll get a say in the kind of content we make for our patrons. We hope to see you there. Without a planet, we're no longer a threat. It's me, it's Kale. Humans. Wait. <laughs> the Titan was the key to finding a new homeworld. Your father hid the Titan. He knew the dredge would come after him. The only way to find it is in your hand. Me? The dredge wants you, only dead. How do you know they want me dead? <laughs> I happen to be humanity's last great hope. I weep for the species. I don't know why I'd never seen this film before, because when this film came out in 2000, uh, I was 11 or 12 years old, and I really, really wanted to see this. I Like, target audience for this film, I think, is a 10 or 11-year-old boy. And I just, I, you know, I never got around to it, or I never got the opportunity to see it, but I've never, like, watched it in the intervening years. But I know that it kind of it bombed and I don't know if that contributed to me just forgetting that it existed and and you know there was no real reminder of this film in the interim or you know it wasn't really being played a lot on tv and stuff I guess either so I probably wouldn't have picked it up there do you remember when this film came out and what did you do you remember seeing it back in 2000 I didn't see it back in 2000 so I think between us we are probably responsible for this being such a failure because maybe if we'd gone to the cinema and a few more of us had gone to see it, it wouldn't have been the shambles that it was. Well, you could only dream. But this film is legendary for bombing at the box office. It was the film that killed off Fox's animated studios. It lost over $100 million in profits. A film that 20th Century Fox were developing in 1998 no one knew what to do with it It got passed around that's why there's three different screenwriters on this film ben edland john august and joss whedon everyone's had a go and it got passed around passed around we're not going to make it live action they've already burnt through 30 million dollars just making all of this debate about whether we're going to make it what's going to (laughs) be then they chuck it to fox animated studios and go right make us an animated version of this we want it like Star Wars. It's easy in it. So they get given this. And the landscape of animation at this time. So this came out in the year 2000. So it's very interesting to look at that era of animated features. Because Anastasia had come out. And that was Fox's last big animated feature. And this was also in the time when Disney was moving away from its 2D animations. And Pixar was just coming about dreamworks were coming into the picture they were making cgi 3d films so that was the big thing around about this time so what we get here is we get fox's animated studios getting given this sci-fi film to work with and they're like right make this who's gonna make it 
they get director Don Bluth. Now, do you do you know Don Bluth? I looked up his credits and I was really astounded. Same, yeah. I, I know the name, but then especially after watching the film, when you look up his credits, a lot clicks into place. I knew Anastasia, or I connected this to Anastasia almost immediately because of the, the visual style and the character designs. But then when you look back at his older films and you kind of join the dots and you're like, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, I know. I know this guy's style without having known who he is. Yeah, he's got such a list of films. And, and talk about nostalgia when we talk about Orin. These were all the films that I watched as a kid. These were ones I'd either taped off the TV or owned on VHS. Stuff like An American Tale, The Land Before Time, All Dogs Go to Heaven. All of these films are... I, I don't think I'd ever clicked in my head that it was the same guy who'd been working on them. But of course... No, me neither. I mean, when I was a kid, I probably thought they were all Disney films. I, I certainly mr canastasia for a for a um disney film at the time and it was very much in competition with disney princess films at the time wasn't it in the late 90s and um, but yeah like anastasia is the most obvious connection because they look so similar in my opinion um but even though those ones you listed as well when you go back in american tale or land before time i think the character design is very similar the way their faces look in, like even you know comparing dinosaurs in land before time to humans maybe less so the humans but some of the alien species in uh titan ae they, they all look the same don't they they're all from the same kind of influence and uh, head of animation there yeah and you can really tell when you're watching these films and also just the content of these these films which which i've just listed off they are more serious in a way they've kind of got quite serious themes around them like an american tale a mouse is a immigrant in america and he's lost his family it's quite dramatic the land before time you've got a similar kind of thing going on it's this ragtag group of dinosaurs they've lost their parents they're trying to get to this mythical place all dogs go to heaven you're dealing with death Anastasia mm. is just a weird film to animate if you're looking for a princess film. <laughs> yes. The story yeah. of Anastasia and all of the stuff that happened with, with Rasputin and everything, it's just mad. So you've got like already a different kind of animated style from Don Bluth. And this move away from Disney from the princess model and coming was like stuff like Pixar, like Toy Story coming in, in way and uh, like Shrek all of these kind of films that aren't your, your average animated film of the time. And Don Bluth was really a part of that, that sort of, that big competition with Disney previously. So with all of that as a backdrop, Titan AE sounds like the ideal project, right? It's uh, something a bit different. It blends 2D and 3D animation and you're getting in a director who's got some serious credentials for animation. This feels like, a good movie to put out in 2000 to compete against whatever Disney's got out in 2000 and and yeah something for a kind of kids family teen type audience it seems like a winner uh, like I, what went wrong I guess is the question well I think one of the main things is that again they lost loads of animators halfway through the production they had to let a bunch of people go no one really they changed um CEOs I think at Fox so they'd lost the person who originally put the project together. Right. And then also you've got a, a group of people. So you've got Don Bluth and, and his team of animators who hadn't really worked on sci-fi before. So again, getting that storytelling across, it's something they're not 100% familiar with. So I think all of those elements kind of create this mismatch of stuff. And then you throw in a lack of promoting as well they put they put some money behind promotion and stuff but for whatever reason it didn't really resonate with the audience that they wanted to they were trying something different they were putting a lot of money into it but no one i don't get the feeling that anybody behind the scenes was really backing it mm. it's always fascinating when movie studios put so much money into a film and then kind of back out at the proverbial last minute which is the marketing budget when when the film is ready to go and then they don't back it with a big campaign it just always seems so weird doesn't it because they it's just a just a good way to lose money at that point isn't it and also maybe it's something to do with with audiences because 
audiences at the time were getting all of this. They were getting served all this 3D animation, all these 3D animated films. So seeing a film which was a mix of 2D and 3D might have seemed a bit old hat to them at this point. They Maybe, were looking yeah. for yeah. your Pixar's and your DreamWorks productions. Yeah, quite possibly. So does that make it look a bit old fashioned to to try and do like a sci-fi animation in but still heavily using traditional 2D animation. Yeah, so there's lots of elements at play which make this a rocky start to the film, even before we've we've reviewed it. There's There were lots of things that were not in its favour. But what did you think of the animation, first off, when you saw it? Like, we talked about, obviously, Don Bluth and his recognisable animation. I was, I was really struck by the creature designs i think they work perfectly yeah brilliant space opera alien design throughout well uh, m- mostly throughout I, I didn't like the dredge very much i thought the dredge looked very early 2000s uh, like reboot beast wars type cgi because there's i think they're sort of fully cgi or some of them are the dredge queen i think is fully cgi which i really didn't like because it was such a contrast to the the designs of the the other alien species that are Don Bluth characters basically and look like um you know animals that he's animated before or the what's the what's Bartok from Anastasia they've they've got that kind of look to them and it lends itself so perfectly to space opera because you can have any kind of like weird and wonderful alien design that you want but brilliantly Don Bluth makes them all look the same but different so they all feel like they exist within the same fictional universe but they all have all so much character to them and so much interesting design based on earth animals and stuff like that but that's where the dredge kind of let things down i think because they look a bit like a computer game yeah because i think the 3d and 2d works at its best when it's just in the settings yeah and you've got these 2d characters which are which look more 3d by proxy because the the settings around them are all 3d animated and it just gives it that sense of dimension it's a tree it's a really tricky thing to pull off but i think the film does do a, a pretty good job of it yeah some of the some of the settings are amazing action sequences also work really well utilizing the the cgi animation um that it really brings them to life and, and makes them very exciting and cool and yeah some of the some of the locations they visit that the one that really sticks out for me is the Oh, are they called the Gower, the 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 bat race that they go to visit that live on a planet mm. with kind of sulfurous lakes and hydrogen trees that might explode if you touch them? That all of that looked absolutely incredible, and it's such a great like s- semi silly sci fi idea that they're just hydrogen trees. They're just sort of balloons made of hydrogen that are potentially dangerous. It's great stuff. Explained very quickly, you kind of grasp it immediately, and then it just looks really cool. Yeah, and it just makes for this really exciting setting, doesn't it? And yeah, and just for the action to play out on this planet, and it becomes believable because of how they've explained it, even though it's quick. It's just yeah, it's really clever how they put all of those things together. But the plot itself is pretty basic, isn't it? You've got a character who we follow throughout the film, Kale. His dad was a research scientist. They escape from Earth just as it's about to be blown up by the dredge. All of humanity are sprawled across the galaxy. Earth has been destroyed. And then the dredge are still after them. There's not really much explanation as to why the dredge are after them, which is a bit a bit annoying. But there is hope for humanity in the form of this project called Titan. And Kale, being the son of the research scientist who had invented it, ends up looking for this project Titan when he's picked up by this space smuggler and his band of misfit aliens. Yeah, uh, and he's he uh, inherits a, a, a device, a ring that gives him the ability to track down the Titan. The Dredge, in particular, are looking to find the Titan to destroy it, and uh, the crew that rescues Kale are very insistent that the Titan is incredibly important. It's going to save humanity, but we don't learn 
much more than that. We don't learn any more than that until really the end of the film. Um, it's really just a, a means to get us through some some cool exotic space locations and have some genuinely amazing looking animated set pieces along the way but i have to say it's one of the most frustrating things is not finding out that stuff about the titan and the dredge we do find out about what the titan is but it's right at the end of the movie um, and we never find out really what the deal with the dredge is what their problem with humans is so they feel like a really weak bad guy yeah, which is a shame because I think that's what this film is missing. It needs to have yeah. a bit more of focus on the evil empire to it because you've just got these blue creatures, which are fully 3D, coming after them throughout the entire film, but you don't know what their motives are. And if there was some sort of explanation or build up as to their motives, it would have worked a bit better i feel and then coupling that with the 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 concept of the titan which is revealed at the end of the movie which is that it's a it's it's like an arc ship but instead of hosting a lot of life it's just hosting the genetic code for an entire earth's worth of of life so humans and and every other species that lived on earth Uh, organized in the most insane way by the way like there's a a, (laughs) like insects next to dolphins i think you know just insane but that's by the by but that I really <laughs> no like category no, no categorization at all no. those you know just absolutely mad but all of those things are are revealed at the end of the movie and I, that was so disappointing because i thought it was the most interesting sci-fi concept in the film i love this idea of what the titan actually was and what its purpose was but we're actually just sort of we just have to take it on faith that it's important and it's going to save humanity throughout 80 percent of the movie um and that just wasn't wasn't interesting and we don't have an interesting bad guy either there's no there's an evil empire but the evil empire has no character to it which is so important in space opera yeah i mean you do have bill pullman's character corso who flips into a bad guy halfway through the film which again seems very out of the blue and doesn't seem very there's no build up to it in to, of that in his character there's no there's just no explanation to it really he's just seen as a really good guy at the start and then suddenly it's like oh actually he's betraying you he's not as optimistic as he as you first thought yeah it feels more like an attempt to do like uh, something a bit more gritty i think than 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 it should do really because it it leans away from space opera in that sense, doesn't it? By trying to make the villains more kitchen sink bad guys that from within. Um, whereas I think what this needs is um, a Ming the Merciless or a Zygon. Um, and we have the Dredge Queen, um, but she, they're not, I don't know. They just, they really just weren't doing anything for me. I think it's made worse <laughs> by the fact that they don't, they have their own language on screen. So you, you, don't, you just don't get as much of a sense of their personality. I want a big theatrical pantomime bad guy, I think, yes. in my space opera movies. It's just not interesting to have a sort of duplicitous pirate character who turns on the heroes halfway through yeah it felt like an attempt at doing something a bit left field but it just didn't quite land but i mean that element and you talk about the kitchen sink stuff it all seems a bit more adult in some of its themes again and we talked about don bluth's animation there is like a grittiness to that in the in the settings what we're seeing with the characters do we see characters get aliens just get killed off in quite spectacular ways at points uh, yeah, Preed gets his neck snapped, doesn't he? I was quite shocked by that towards the end of the film. Because again, they're, they're doing that thing where a lot of the violence is uh, directed towards the dredge and the dredge, they're not robots, but they're beings of energy. So seeing them get sliced to bits, is it, it, it doesn't have the same sense of violence to them. One character gets like exploded, but he's like a bug character. He's like a big cockroach. Mm. And it's very comedic it's a comedic death but all of the character all of the alien characters are it's anthropomorphized animals like that bug so where he dies this kind of comical squishy bug death and then preed gets his neck snapped in a very well just violent scene isn't it and that really caught me off guard i wasn't expecting to see any characters get their necks snapped that's for sure especially not one who's been with them throughout the entire thing and been a member of the crew yeah it's it's very yeah it's very shocking to be honest from this kind of film but 
I think in that way, it shares a lot of its DNA with Star Chaser, just in terms of that almost teen audience it's looking at for a film like this. Mm. So you said like at 12, 13, you would have quite liked to have seen this film. Yeah. And I think having that kind of appeal for that age range is something that they didn't quite know what to do with from Fox Mm. because it doesn't seem like they properly hit that market, but it's definitely there for this kind of film. And I, and again, I, I liked this one as well. I thought it was quite good that I think that what I would just say is that same with this one, both of these films are just lacking that one little special something, aren't they? And they really could be absolutely classic movies if they just had it. Uh, Star Chase has got a great villain. Titan doesn't have a great villain and Star Chase has got some other weird stuff to it, but Titan's like quite tightly knit and quite well done throughout. But it's just a shame that they're both, they're just both missing that because we don't, I feel like we're missing this definitive Hollywood uh, animated space opera. And it's really funny looking at it, having just come off the back of doing our anime episode where both of those had quite serious elements in them like you're looking at war with gundam and you're looking at this love triangle in macross and both of those kind of rotate the space opera around it whereas these two they don't really have that kind of grittiness to it which isn't a isn't a problem but it it feels like that's why those anime ones work because they are considering their teen adult audience more Whereas with these, they're still kind of halfway in with the kids market and halfway in with the teen market. I think there's also a, a bit of a, an unashamed attempt in those anime films to do something that the creator wanted to do. In, in Macross, it's mixing space opera with uh, romantic drama and music. And there is a commercial element to that as well, because they're trying to sell, they were trying to sell CDs or tapes or whatever. But the blending of those three things is is very unusual and requires a creative force who is personally invested in doing that. And then Gundam, we talked about how, you know, there was uh, the creator's personal interest in making this very realistic robot series to go against the, to, the, the trend of super robots at the time. Whereas compare those to these films... And they all just seem to bundle together a load of stuff to get an animated space opera movie out. So Star Chaser does have some really interesting, really cool original concepts, but it's using a very clear Star Wars template and modeling on that. And then Titan just sounds like a mess behind the scenes. They didn't even, you know, they've got they've got like an, an animation auteur in, in Don Bluth, but they're getting him in at the end because they've exhausted all other options for trying to make this film. It's not... Don Bluth's dream project. It doesn't sound like he wants to be doing sci-fi. I think he does a great job of it, but this isn't a passion project for him. Yeah, you can really tell with with how this all comes together, can't you? Just that that disaster behind the scenes. But you've also got a really all-star cast doing the voices as well. Yeah. Which again, you would have thought that would have brought in an audience because you've got all of these what we know as big names in there. You've got Matt Damon as Kale. You've got Bill Pullman, we've met, we mentioned. John Leguizamo, I didn't know that he was in this because he plays this goon, the amphibian creature, the chief scientist. Well, he's got a great voice, hasn't he? He's great for animation because he can he can, he can just really like disappear into a character when he's doing a vocal performance. It's, it's sometimes quite hear, hard to hear John Leguizamo. He's really great. He's, he's, um, he's just one of those actors who actually, he's probably as good at doing voice acting as he is at, at doing live action acting, which is really impressive because they are very different disciplines. Um, and he seems to be able to handle both of them just basically the same. And he's equally good, whatever type of thing he's doing. Um, what did you think of the the other cast, the rest of the cast performances? I mean, they've got, they've got some really good people in there, haven't they? They've got Nathan Lane, who has just got one of those voices you instantly recognise. You're like, oh, it's that guy from that thing. Yeah, Nathan Lane is that person, isn't he? Well, yeah. In, in contrast to John Leguizamo, Nathan Lane does not disappear into a role. Nathan Lane is uh, forever Nathan Lane. Um, luckily, he's he's absolutely wonderful in everything he does, um, and he's a lot of fun. He, I I don't know if he's a bit miscast here because he does play this slightly 
rough and unpleasant Preed character who then turns out to to be even more rough and unpleasant than we thought he was and he's a traitor and he's violent and he gets his neck snapped that's not your typical Nathan Lane role is it but he's good in it he is good in it he's putting in a good shift Bill Pullman's quite good although I don't know if there's something in the way that Bill Pullman is performing this but I knew that Bill Pullman was going to be a bad guy something about his voice is like this <laughs> this is not the hero of the piece I don't trust this guy um, and I was not a little bit surprised uh, Janine Garafalo is very good in this as well the kind of big legged kangaroo weapon specialist alien. <laughs> as long as you're not talking about Janine <laughs> when you're talking about <laughs> big legged comedian Janine Garafalo no um, <laughs> she's she's great in that yeah she's really good but James I have to say I think this is a career low performance for Matt Damon yeah well, there's no animation in his voice for the animation, is there? It's shocking, isn't it? He doesn't yeah. look like... He's just not playing the same character that's being drawn. It feels like he's just sat there in, a vo- in like a vocal booth just going, right, I've got to do my work for today. Yeah. He's not really it, in there, is he? I, well, I just don't think he can voice act. I can't really think of many other voice acting roles that he's done i like matt damon yeah. i think he's i think matt damon's got better at acting as he's done it but you know i think he's always been at least decent in his early roles he's good but i don't think he's a voice actor basically based on this anyway this is you know if this is anything to go by and it's a good lesson for just because john leguizamo can be great on camera and then hop in a vocal booth and be great in animation it doesn't mean it's going to be that easy for every actor. It, it It's a different discipline and you can't just walk into the booth and start speaking. It, it's awful. Drew Barrymore's not much better either. Yeah, I also, like, looking back at it now, seeing that Drew Barrymore played a character called Akima Kunimoto. Is that her full name? Yeah. Oh, Jesus I Christ. was very much like, this does not feel right. A little bit of whitewashing happening in the vocal cast there. Yeah. One of the other names I recognised on the cast was a rapper called Tone Loke, who I didn't know voiced the kind blind alien who raised Kale. He's not in the film very much, is he? But he's one of the more interesting voices yeah. in the film. What happens inter- to his character? Does he die or does he just... Mm, or maybe, but, well, do the dredge destroy the uh, the salvage facility that he lives on at the start of the film? I can't remember if the whole thing's destroyed or not just feels like they don't really dwell on that do they like kale's nah. not very he, kale's been raised by this alien and he's just like oh he's gone now yeah oh well <laughs> yeah uh no i can't remember I, I have no idea what happens to him so i don't think it's really made clear to be honest in yeah the film. well i mean again it's the classic space opera pacing we've got to get to the next planet we've got to do the next scene Absolutely. that's where we're at speaking of which have you got any highlights of those set pieces in this film I do. I did quite enjoy the the ice meteors towards the end, and when they're doing all of that clever stuff around the the spaceships and dodging around in reflections like a hall of mirrors. I, I enjoyed all of that. Yeah, me too. It's a hall. It's a a very typical hall of mirrors scene in a movie, but I've never seen it done with spaceships before. That's great. Yeah. That's really fun. Yeah, and of course it all linked back because the fact there's all that ice around means that they can make the Titan work because the Titan is going to make a new planet and they presumably need those ice meteors to make the planet. That could have been me overthinking it. But is that's that what, what happens? Do they well, make the planet where it is? I thought they flew well, it off somewhere at the end. No, they, keep, they sort of make the planet with the Titan because that's the big reveal that the Titan, of course, is going to make a planet, which yeah. you can't right, really guess okay. from the title. So, but yeah, then all of the ice meteors become the water on the planet is kind of what I got from that. Oh, okay. Was... I might have misunderstood. I thought they powered it up using the um, dredge and then flew to some other planet. And they, just, do, like... they do power it with the dredge, which I think is a really quite dark method of creating yeah. a new world. They basically, they kill the alien race that has been pursuing them and use their essence to create a new earth, which is... I yeah. do wonder if that's why they don't go into any more detail on the dredge because any more characterization of the dredge could lead to some kind of feelings of empathy for basically committing genocide on them. I, I mean, they were trying to commit genocide against us. They started it. Uh, but uh, yeah, we do just kind of wipe them out and use their life force to create a new planet. So maybe it's a little bit either too risky in the narrative or too much 
hard work to explain them in a way that doesn't make you feel bad for them getting entirely wiped out at the end. It's just always a shame when there's no grey areas in characters, when they're just black and white. They're, they're the good guys, they're the bad guys. I always like a bit of nuance with it, but obviously they just couldn't couldn't figure it out, didn't have the time. Hey, we're doing an animated film, it doesn't matter. It was that kind of thing. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think that that's what that's the feeling it leaves you with, which is a little bit disappointing, I have to say. You don't want to be left thinking that at the end of a film, do you? No, exactly that. And looking at this film now, do you think it, it deserves to be remembered as what it became known as the the film that killed Fox Animation Studios? Or should it be a hidden gem like we said about Star Chaser? Yeah, I think it's a hidden gem. I mean, I think it's good. And I'm a big defender of, you know, the the creative forces behind the film, not the not the film studios that pay for it. Fox Animation Studios killed itself, you know. Like it's I'm I'm not gonna blame a movie for for the death of a studio if they've failed to run their business in a sensible way that that one disastrous animation movie kills you off then that's that's on your management practices in my view this film's just like a bit disappointing its legacy should not just be that it's that it killed off an animation studio it's interesting it looks amazing it's a weird little quirk of don bluth's filmography to kind of end his film career with uh, with a sci-fi space opera movie I, I i really like it even though it disappoints in some ways how about you yeah i enjoyed it i think with both of these films i enjoyed them but they're not necessarily ones i'd be hurrying to revisit which i think is a bit telling sure i mean Sp- uh, star chaser definitely i would absolutely catch titan on tv if i was just browsing tv and this was on um i'd absolutely leave it on and and you know enjoy the rest of the film i'll be thinking in my head like oh just just in time for the hydrogen trees or just in time for the hall of mirrors those those are such cool scenes that yeah i i I could happily watch this one again only under those circumstances where it's like on tv and i just happen to land on it yeah it does feel a bit like that but like you say it's a it's a fascinating one to look at same with star chaser and just seeing how animation had was working over in america during this time period and how they were exploring space opera as a genre with these kind of films and everything that came off of them. It feels, it feels like they have, they quite, they missed the mark there. And I think since these two films came, have come out animation and sci-fi people know how to mix the two. Now you've got stuff like love and robots, which came out and that is a perfect example of sci-fi and animation done well. And I think there is less of a stigma around animation being turned into an adult or teen film now yeah whereas back then there was still this we're getting over the disney phase where every animated film is a kid's film so i think both of these kind of led the way in some ways to what we know now as the perfect mixture of animation and sci-fi. I think that's, yeah, I agree. That's a great summary. That should be their legacy, not not just killing off an animation studio. Yeah, let's not linger on those thoughts. Titan AE, you did all right, and so did you, Star Chaser. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're forgiven. <laughs> all is forgiven, guys. Well, that's all for now on uh, Western Animation. We hope you've enjoyed this journey through Western Animated Space Opera. Um, we will be back with you soon, but not that soon, folks. It's summer holidays. We're taking a little bit of time off. Um, I'm going to Arrakis. I'm going to <laughs> I'm going worm spotting on Arrakis. But while I'm there, I'm also going to get my still suit tuned up, James, because it's starting to smell a bit funny in the pipes. But yeah, I'm going there for my summer break. You off anywhere nice, James? Uh, I'm off to uh, Moss Isley. I'm going to have a okay, few drinks nice. in the cantina. Maybe maybe catch a bit of a tan on those dunes. I think we've both got very good desert summery holidays planned, haven't we? Yeah, they're good spots. Good spots for sunbathing. James has two sons, I believe, on uh, outside Mars Isley. You're really going to catch a tan there. That's lovely. Can't wait. I heard the clientele were a bit dodgy, though. Yeah, you just, just keep yourself to yourself, please. Come back in one piece. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, as Matt has said, we are taking a short break over the summer, but we will be back with more episodes on the main series for you in September. And we have plenty more to cover in our Space Opera series. What are some of the highlights you're looking forward to covering next time when we reconvene our Space Opera series, Matt? Well, speaking of wretched hives of scum and villainy, we're going to be looking at the Star Wars prequel trilogy. <laughs> of course, we're returning to George Lucas's auteur masterpieces from the late 90s and early 2000s. Yes, we will be looking at those. Before that, when we reconvene, we'll be looking at The Last Starfighter and Ender's Game. So that'll be an interesting one to look at. Very computer game orientated sci-fi space operas from what I understand but we've got plenty more we're also looking at Luc Besson we're going to be looking at the fifth element and Valyrian aren't we yep uh, we've got more Dune content later in the series and I'm very excited to be looking at Firefly and Serenity some of my absolute favorite sci-fi of all time yes there's plenty more space opera coming your way lots to cover as we get closer into modern day space operas within the series if you can't wait until we're back you know where to find us patreon.com slash journey through sci-fi we will keep on going for our patrons through our summer holidays plenty more episodes over there in the meantime and if you're looking for more content from the main series feel free to go back into the archives and check out our other series we've got a plethora of stuff there we've covered ai space time travel virtual reality dystopia Lots of other episodes in the back catalogue to revisit and listen to. So I think that you've got plenty to get on with, listeners. I think we can leave you to it for a couple of months while we take our holidays. Um, that's all for us. We will be back with you very soon with more Journey Through Space Opera. Right, I've got to get in my land speeder because if not, I'm going to miss my flight. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Journey Through Sci-Fi. You can find us at journeythroughsci-fi.com, where you can find links to our social media and join the conversation. If you've enjoyed what you've heard and want to support us, why not leave us a review on your podcast app of choice? It really helps new people find the show. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash journey through sci-fi where you can receive exclusive bonus episodes every month don't forget to subscribe to the show and we'll see you again next time for another journey through sci-fi journey through sci-fi